Well, good morning, Wyoming. <laughs> it has been just a real blessing. It really has been to share these times with you and and part be a part of your convention. And um, you're a wonderful diocese. I mean, I could hang around here for if I wasn't retiring, I'd put my name in. <laughs> oh. But you really are. You're wonderful. I'm so glad Bishop Catherine is here with you for, for this time, this transitional interim time. And um, just so thankful for your leadership standing committee, the council, the foundation, and all the leadership of all the churches, the clergy. That This is a wonderful diocese, and it has been a joy to be here with you. And because you gave a special gift to the Buffalo Bills, you will always be in my heart. <laughs> Allow me, if you will, to pick up the theme that, that um, the liturgists and others have so carefully woven um, from 1 John 4, God is love, um, to the gospel. I give you this commandment that you love one another. The theme of this convention, love always. In case you didn't miss it, the theme is love. <laughs> but allow me, if you will, to pick up a story that speaks to this. And you know it well. I'll just read a brief excerpt from it. It's in Luke's gospel in the 10th chapter. Jesus said this. A lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, a lawyer, by the way. I know there's some in the room. <laughs> Wherever two or three Episcopalians gather together, there's always a lawyer in the midst. <laughs> but anyway, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus and he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what's written in the law? You lawyer, what's written in the law? What do you read there? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and live. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself, do that, that trinity of love, if you will. Do that in life and find life itself. Life that the world did not give to you and the life that the world cannot take from you. Life that will give you strength in the most difficult time. Life that will lift you up when the gravity of reality sometimes Pulls you down. Love. You find life. Not easy life. Anybody tells you that is trying to sell you something. All right, all right. No, no, no. But life, not bargain basement life, but the real deal. Life as the source of life itself, who the Bible says is love. Life as God decrees and intends since the very beginning. Now, the, the lawyer came, and it's hard to know, was, was he sincere or was this a setup? It's really hard to tell. You can't tell. And I, I need to say that, that there are a lot of lawyer stories in the four Gospels. I won't bore you with them all now, but Jesus spent a lot of time with lawyers. When I was a parish priest, I spent a lot of time with morticians. Then I became a bishop and a presiding bishop, Bishop Catherine will know. And I spent a lot of time with lawyers. <laughs> and thank God for our Episcopal lawyers. Thank God for them. But the lawyer comes, so we don't know, was he sincerely asking or was this a test? Who knows? It probably was a mix of all. And he said, great teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? to find life that is of such a quality here and now that it lasts unto eternity. What, 
What's the secret, well, Oprah? What, what, what is the key? What's the secret to, to life? And Jesus says, well, what's written in the law of Moses? You're the lawyer. So, what's in? And, and this is the one time where Jesus gets in one of these conversations, and actually it's the lawyer who answers. In Matthew's version of this, Jesus answers it, which may be another lawyer. I keep telling you, this was the Palestine, um, sorry to say Palestine Liberation, I mean, Palestine Legal Association. And Jesus kept running into them all over the place. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the lawyer answers the question. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, you show the, the Shema in Deuteronomy, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew's gospel, Jesus says it, and he adds on these two, hang all the law in the prophets. Everything that is in the scriptures, everything in the Hebrew scriptures, everything in the Christian New Testament, everything that is called the word of God, it, it is about this love, this love of God. And if, if it's not about love, I don't care how religious, I don't care how holy and sanctimonious it sounds. I don't care how many Bible passages are quoted. If it's not about love, it is not about God. Yes, it's clear. No. But Jesus says, you've answered. Love and find the secret of life. Love the God who made you. God didn't have to do it. Love that God. And then love what God has made. Your neighbor. Now that doesn't mean you got to like them. But love them anyway. Because love is about seeking the good and the welfare and the well-being of others as well as the self. S seek that good and that well-being. Love that neighbor and love yourself. I, I love me some Michael Curry. I, for years now, and this is the honest to God truth, my wife, if she was here, she said, don't you tell that again. <laughs> but, but for years, I get up in the morning, and the first thing I do is I go over to the vanity. I, I realize why they call it the vanity. It has the lights, and they make you look better than you really do at five in the morning. And I look in the vanity and look at myself, and I look, and I have to wipe my eyes, make sure I've got my trifocals on and adjust the distance so I can get the right. And I look in the mirror and I say, Denzel Washington, is that you? <laughs> love God, <laughs> love your neighbor and love yourself even if it's an illusion, love yourself. <laughs> Jesus says this love, this comprehensive love, this is the key to life. Do this. You will find life that's not even the titanic realities of death and hell, evil and injustice and bigotry. Not even those titanic realities. Not even death can ultimately take it away from you. Last night we mentioned the words of Disraeli, Gandhi, and Jimi Hendrix. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, then the world, then we will know peace. But remember, Jesus was talking to a lawyer, which means that wasn't the end of the conversation. And the and lawyer said, now, Jesus, this is good. I, I like what you're saying. And, and I appreciate it. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. That's good. But could we define neighbor more precisely? Could, could, could we sort of narrow? That's what he was really asking. Could we narrow neighbor down? And Jesus doesn't fall for the trick. Instead of answering directly from the law, he tells a story. This guy went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he got beaten up and was left on mugged, left on the side of the road. 
One religious person came by and for whatever reason, walked on by. Another one came by. These were high religious folk. I would imagine a bishop walking on by. I know bishops, trust me. <laughs> and, and maybe a presiding bishop or an archbishop of Canterbury. He's not here, and don't you tell him I said this. <laughs> not here. And, and, and he walks on by the Pope. Came by, and, and he walked on by the Dalai Lama. I mean, look, just go through the list. All of the folk you would expect to stop didn't stop. The Dalai Lama would have, the rest of them wouldn't have. But anyway. <laughs> and finally, somebody who was an enemy, somebody who this person did not get along with, a Samaritan in those days, walked on and stopped and took care of the person, poured oil on the wounds, put them on the back on their own donkey. And this person walked and let the person the enemy, took him to the hospital. I can imagine this story if it was a Democrat beating on the road. I won't say which one. And a Republican came by. Let's just say it's the two presidential candidates we have. <laughs> Imagine that story, right? And, and one of them saw the other beaten up on the road, took them to the inn, made sure that they had medical insurance coverage. All right, y'all with me now? You see this parable? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that took care of all their needs because every human child of God ought to be taken care of, you know, did that. And went on. I mean, imagine this if in, around the world, if, if those who are adversaries took care of each other simply because they're children of God. Imagine this country. We just take care of each other no matter who we are, no matter how you vote, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your sexual orientation, no matter how rich, how poor, how many PhDs or no degrees. Imagine world because when the power of love overcomes the love of common then we will know peace I want to rename this parable instead of the parable of the good Samaritan I want to rename this the parable of the beloved community because this is how beloved community when one person cares for another person, not for what they can get out of it, but simply because this is a fellow child of God. This is my sister. This is my brother. This is my sibling. Simply because we are children of God. And if we are, am I right about that? And if we are children of God, if we all got the same parent, that means we're all related. That means we're family. We may be dysfunctional, but, but we're family. And when that happens, what Dr. King called the beloved community begins to happen, and then justice rolls down like a mighty stream. Then everybody is God's somebody. When I was going off to school, going off to college, I was in the car with my dad, and I don't know where we were going, but I, you know, it was. 16 or 17, so I was driving. Always wanted to drive. Now I don't want to drive. I get my kids to do it. But anyway, and so at some point, he just said, uh, I want you to remember one thing when you go off to school. And I'm probably rolling my eyes thinking, oh, now, what, what now? And he said, when you go off to school, I want you to treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your sister. Now, he used to say that kind of thing to us all the time, but I remember thinking, Look, man, you have just, I had plans for college. <laughs> and I was going to be away from you and grandma. I was going to be on my own footloose and fan. You have just ruined four years of college <laughs> and all my plans. 
But I knew what he was talking about. Treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your sister, because that girl is your sister. Every boy like your brother, because he is. Every woman like your mama, because she is. Every man like your daddy. Every person like a member of your family. Show them the same love that you have for your own kinfolk. Show them how they are important before God and to you. Then don't just stop with your own uh, with folk you know. Go out and work and labor to build a society where everybody is God's somebody, where we treat each other like children of God. Treat each other like God's children, like brothers, sisters, siblings, like family at its best. And then we'll have a word, world where we'll learn to lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, then we really will know peace. And human life work. God's will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me, I'm going to sit down now because I know y'all got a convention to go to. And we're here, okay. <laughs> but when I, was a, when I was Bishop of North, I used to get in the car every day and drive somewhere over the state of North Carolina. And then I became presiding bishop. And I don't think Bishop Catherine told me this, but I wouldn't be getting in a car. You may have told me, actually. You're going to be getting on an airplane several times a week. And, and so I did. And since I live in the South, there's only one airline that you're allowed to fly legally in the South. It's called Delta. We give nods to American and United, but it's really de about Delta Airlines. And so, you know, from, from Raleigh, I've got, I can get direct to New York, but pretty much everywhere I go, and I go, I mean, literally, I do this a couple times a week, I go from Raleigh to Atlanta. And if you're on Delta Airlines, you are probably going through Atlanta to go anywhere. In fact, the saying in the South is, you may be going to heaven, you may be going to hell, but if you're on Delta Airlines, <laughs> and so, you know, I get on the airplanes and do this, I mean, several times a week. And actually, I know the flight crews from Raleigh to New York. I know them all. And so anyway, I get, you know, I get in the, in the a plane and, um, you know, I always let them tell them hello and make sure the flight attendants know I'm one of the good passengers. I won't give you any trouble. And, and if we have any trouble, I'd like you to get me off first. Uh, <laughs> but so, you know, I get in, I take and sit down and, and, and get my seat. And, um, you know, I, I used to actually open the Bible and read it. Now I got the Bible on my iPad. So I just like go to my iPad, and find my scripture. I will lift my eyes up to the hills where it cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, made heaven and earth. I don't usually play prayer 20, the 23rd Psalm. I don't want to get God. So I, so I sort of leave it there and then um, sit down, put the seatbelt on and do everything you have to do, you know, on the plane. And you know how it goes. Uh, eventually, when everybody gets on the plane, uh, the flight attendants come out and they say uh, to Delta Airlines, please be in your seats with your seatbelt fashioned, your trays in their upright and locked positions um, in the unlikely event. I love those unlikely events. <laughs> In the unlikely event um, of a loss of cabin pressure, um, oxygen mask will descend. Sounds like the Lord descending from heaven. Oxygen mask will descend, put your mask on first and then put it, assist your neighbor putting their mask on. In the unlikely, I love, here we go. In the unlikely event of a loss of electrical power, I said, loss of electrical, what are you talking about? That's time to say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's <laughs> Anyway, she said there, there are lights on the aisle and um, there are exits um, in the front, above the wings, and in the back. And they go through their whole routine. We'd like to welcome you to Delta Airlines. Then as they get ready, they pull out of the, you know, the gate and, and sort of move toward the runway. 
if you're in LaGuardia in New York, you're not taking off for a half hour. And, but, but in Raleigh, you'll get off pretty quickly. And so they pull out of the gate, and it goes toward the runway, and then the pilots come off. I gone to the US Air Force Academy, because they got that pilot's voice. So we want to welcome you all aboard Delta Airlines. And we're looking forward to giving you a nice flight all the way to wherever it is we're going. And, and I hate it when they say well, I'm going to, and they stop because they're looking at the paper and figure out where we are going. <laughs> so, anyway, they said we're going, we're going, we might encounter a little chop on the, I love it, a little chop on the way out. Uh, so we're going to leave the seatbelt sign on for a little while until we can find a nice cruising altitude somewhere around 35,000 feet. And so then you know what happens. They finally get clearance to take off. And they start taking off and, and they start, and you can actually feel um, Sir Isaac Newton beating gravity. You can actually feel it. And that plane is challenging gravity and it's picking up speed and it's going, I gotta be careful here. You know, uh, Bishop uh, Catherine is a pilot. Anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. She does. That plane starts moving up that. The speed is rotates and you can hear the wheel coming in closing up and um, the, the flaps have been down and it's going up higher and it's defying gravity and it's saying Sir Isaac Newton bite the dust and it when it gets to 10,000 feet the little bell goes off Beep. that means you can turn on the Wi-Fi if it works and then you get up high enough and you eventually get up to 35,000 feet or so and then they turn off the seatbelt sign. You can move about the cabin, folk, but if you're in your seat, we ask that you put your safe seatbelt on just in case we run into some unexpected turbulence. I love these unexpected in the unlikely event. Anyway, so usually by that time, I get up and go to the bathroom. I'm 71 years old. And so, so I get up and go to the bathroom, come back, take my seat. And I, I've done this enough, I sit down and saying, I'm up here at 35,000 feet. I don't know who the pilot is. In fact, I don't know that I've even seen him. At door, I don't know, did I have a good night the night before? Did, 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 you know, I assume they were following the rules and weren't drinking the night before. Just had a little coffee, but that's about all. And I don't know anything about that pilot. I don't know, did, did he or she get a C in pilot school? <laughs> and like when you go to your doctor, I trust you an A student. <laughs> I don't need a C student operating on me right now. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know anything about the pilot, the co-pilot, if there's an engineer on board. I don't know anything about, I don't know anything about the mechanics who serviced the plane. Did they do what they were supposed to do? Or did they take some shortcuts so, so longer lunch? I Airplane company. Uh, remember when the companies used to go out and come back in business with a new name? I don't know anything about have they kept up with their business plan? Are they following what the FAA tells them they need to do? And then I ask, is the FAA just and we're in trouble with the politicians? I don't know anything about any of that. And I'm at 35,000 feet. I have entrusted my life to Delta Airlines and I don't know anything. Now, why would I question the Lord God Almighty when I know who God is, when I trust Delta Airlines, and I don't know? I finally got to a point in life. I filed for my Social Security recently. It was a pleasant surprise. Finally got to a point, I figured if I can trust the Lord God Almighty, I trust Delta Airlines, I can trust the Lord God Almighty, and I can trust his way, which is the way of love. And as hard as it is sometimes, by God, I'm going to do my best by grace to be a loving person. Let the world know at the Diocese of Wyoming. Well, no, that these Episcopalians, we don't always get it right. No, we don't. 
But doggone it, if we make our mistakes, we're going to go down loving. Let the world see and know that e pluribus unum is possible for people who will love each other. Let the world see and know that we can transform this world from a neighborhood into a family where we learn to lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more, where love is the law that leads us and guides us. Let the world, let our children know, let the generations yet let them know that love is the way. It is the answer. Because love comes from God. You can't get a better deal than God. God love you, Wyoming. God bless you. May God hold you, your congregations, and communities. May God hold in those almighty hands of love.